Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My name is Polly and I'm an alcoholic. And by God's grace in a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, I haven't had a drink since April, April the 11th of 1977. And for that, I am eternally grateful. I have a home group, and that's the West Connect group in Jacksonville, Florida. We meet at 7 o'clock on Monday nights. <clears throat> I have a sponsor. My sponsor has a sponsor, and I sponsor, and the women I sponsor sponsor, and so on and so forth. And uh, I am beyond honored to be here. And um, I know today, and I'm going to talk about it, that uh, I'm here to talk about step 12. But uh, there is no way that I can even say anything without talking about how important the people are in Bellingham, Washington, Birch Bay, Washington, all the towns surrounding Bellingham, how important those people are to me. And that uh, Dave and I moved to Bellingham, Washington, or Birch Bay, Washington in 2003. And um, I can't remember what the dates are, but I'm sure that Eileen and Don and Bob and Mary Jo will, because we were all the first ones that re, um, we, re, we resurrected the Mount Baker Roundup. And uh, it was uh, being a part of this and being a part of the Mount Baker Roundup was absolutely uh, one of the most amazing things that Dave and I have ever been participating in. And so that's why I'm just saying that uh, there is not enough love to describe how much I love the seven years that we, Dave and I lo lived in the Pacific Northwest. I absolutely loved it. Being here on this conference is an honor, just an absolute honor. And the only thing that's, uh, that I'm sad about is that uh, I should be there. That was the big deal. We were going to be there. And it was like uh, a trip in a lifetime for Dave and I. We were heading back to Bellingham, and we were going to stay for about 10 days and, you know, visit all the people we love in, in Bellingham, Washington, and uh, the surrounding areas. And um, we didn't get to do that. But I tell you, it is amazing that I'm sitting here. I've got my gallery up, and I'm sitting here looking at um, the faces on here, and it's just my heart is warmed. I'm right now, and right next to me is Marion and Peter, and Marion is in Florida as well. And here I end up coming to Bellingham, Washington, after we had met you know, some years ago, and uh, and then she moved to Florida, and we moved to Florida, and now we're in Florida. And, you know, how does God arrange all this stuff? How does all this happen? And it's just like I'm looking at the people that I have the, the privilege of sponsoring and uh, that are on here. I mean, how does this happen? How does somebody like me get to have something like this happen. And um, I just can't tell you, those of you who are living there in the Pacific Northwest, and I see the tears coming out of Miriam because I know she misses it too. And it's, you miss it. And I'm, and I'm, I just, uh, I've had so much fun talking to Linda and she's been part of putting this together. And it's just, and I think about Linda. Linda was the one who was our realtor that we got our, that 
that found the lot that we built our house on. And, you know, you could just go on and on and on and on with the memories of what's of how wonderful that it is to have been a part of that, have been a part of that AA, have been a part of the fellowship in uh, that beautiful part of the world. And I don't know if Marty's still on, but my God, I loved running up to Canada and doing all of the stuff that I got to do in Canada because it was just close. And, and Marty, you, I just loved listening to you. You're just such a special person. And every time I look, Melina's on there and she was part of our home group. And it just seemed like every time we had uh, our annual uh, celebration of the group, our yearly celebration of the group, we always wanted Marty. It just seemed like Marty came down and was part of Third Legacy just about every year that we celebrated, just because nobody ever got tired of hearing Marty. And I don't know how many times he came, he came to Mount Baker Roundup that we had. Him. So it's just, and uh, and th there's some, there's a, a couple of people on here that we just got through doing a step study with Marty, which was most was one of the most amazing step studies I've ever ever done in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. So anyway, I just uh, there's I just can't get over the memories of uh, of being here and uh, Linda and Don and Eileen. Just thank you so, so much for allowing me to be a part of Mount Baker and uh, being able to be here. And I'd love to be in that crowded room with us all huddled up together. And we always had more chairs in there than the room was supposed to hold. And But we just did it anyway because it was just... You just didn't want to turn anybody away. And my gosh, there was the, the thing that we always said, there was just room for one more. And uh, so anyway, thank you, thank you, thank you for having me here. And I feel so honored, so honored that I have been able to be on this conference with the people I've been on the conference with. I got to listen to Carla start us off, and I know what an amazing woman Carla is. I get the opportunity to share with her. I even get to be on a concept workshop of where she's leading, and I just love the person that she is, and I'm so grateful that I get to know her. And Ivor, I hadn't ever met before, but I'm really, I feel so blessed that I got to hear you. And Georgia, you're just precious. And I've been able to, uh, I even got to host her in Jacksonville, Florida for the Florida, for the Unity Roundup when we had her in Florida. I was thinking it was Florida State. So it was so fun to pick her up and take her around and be her hostess. And I just love you, Georgia, anytime I get to be able to be a part of you. And Larsine and Steve, I did not get to hear yesterday because I had somewhere, someplace else I had to be. But Larsine, I have known Larsine since just about I moved to Southern California when we started Woman to Woman so many years ago. I don't even know what year that was, Larsine, but I know by now it's got to be way over 30 years ago. I mean, it was just a long time ago, and I just think about how we got to, to work together and how we got to share all those years together and how special you and Butch have always been and Dave's in my life, and it's just been so special. And Steve Lee, I'm telling you, I love you. Thanks to Connie. She sends me a, a meditation every day. So I get to share in Steve and Connie's life and being so grateful that all these years we've been able to be together and to do things in Alcoholics Anonymous. And Darren, oh my God, I get to 
know these people and I get to know them up close and personal and they're all the way in Sydney, Australia. How do you do that? It's just those are the kind of, it's, it's just Alcoholics Anonymous. It's Alcoholics Anonymous. Here we are. I'm always kidding about my Aussies and how we get to be with each other. We're people who normally would not mix, but all of us just get together in Alcoholics Anonymous and we speak the same language. We all speak the same language. And uh, Hilda, oh my gosh, Hilda, it was just so wonderful to hear you. I always laugh when I hear Hilda speak. Always have a laugh when I hear her. You are absolutely marvelous. I'm so happy I got to see you in March when Paula and I were in Southern California. I'm so happy that I got to see you and be able to talk to you personally. And now I get to see you on Zoom. And my, and my favorite conference in the world, the Mount Baker Railroad, and being able to be a part of this. And Marty, there's not enough words to say about you, sweetheart. I already said a lot, but we've been friends for a long, long time. And uh, it's just so wonderful that we still get to share that friendship. And again, I'm looking around and I see, I just see these faces and it's just, uh, just thank you. Thank you for the opportunity of being at the Mount Baker Roundup and being able to just just resurrect some amazing, some just some amazing memories. Thank you so much. Uh, as Darren said earlier, his job was six and seven. Well, my job is 12. I'm here to talk about step 12. And uh, I'm so honored that I get to talk about step 12. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read two paragraphs. I'm going to read some other stuff too, too, as I, as I do step 12, because I just think the big book has the greatest stuff about step 12. And I'm going to read the first paragraph in the big book, and I'm going to read the first paragraph in the 12 and 12, because I think that says it all about step 12. And uh, uh, one of the things that I want to talk about is when I read about what I'm doing this is I want to talk about the three, the three things about step 12, because the first thing is I'm having, having had a spiritual awakening and having had a spiritual awakening is that I have worked the other 11 steps in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm so grateful that I came into these rooms in 1977. I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and I had been court committed to treatment. And one of the things that I know today is that God works in my life without my permission. God continues to work in my life without my permission because I ended up going to detox twice. I did not ask to go the first time. My husband took me to detox and he said, there's a treatment center and it's not far from our house and I wish you would go. And I entered that detox center and I stayed there seven days and then I did something that I'm sure none of you on this Zoom did because you're probably all really principled people. But what I did is I ended up having an affair in detox. I went to detox, ran off with a guy for 58 days, and then ended up in a motel in Euless, Texas. And the director of that detox center came and got me, brought me back to that detox center, And I did not call him and ask him to come rescue me and save my life and brought me back into that detox center more dead than alive. And what I had done is I had reached a place where I was in pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization and feeling there's no way I can possibly live sober because I am a person 
who has hurt my children. I was, res I was a military wife responsible for my children and capable of taking care of them because of my alcoholism. Then in 1974, my husband is retired from the military. He is 100% disabled. He has congestive heart failure as a, as a result of Agent Orange, and his heart is so enlarged that he can hardly walk across the floor, and he can hardly take a breath. And he is about 80% bedridden, and I am supposed to be his caretaker, and I can't do it. I am not capable of doing it. And three hours away in Abilene, Texas, my daddy is dying from colon cancer, and I am his only child. So Hilda, I know about being an only child. I am an only child, and I was not able to go see my dad. Who does that? What kind of an evil person cannot take care of her children, cannot take care of her husband who is so sick and cannot see her father and runs up with a guy in detox? What kind of a person does that? And I just, and also being raised Southern Baptist and feeling that God is going to punish you and you're going to be, and you're going to burn in hell, I felt no hope. And what I did is I ended up getting a bottle of scotch and a bottle of Valium. And I told on April the 8th of 1977, I was pronounced dead on arrival in the hospital in Bedford, Texas, because a friend of mine decided to get in her car and drive to see if she could find me. And she found me in a motel and called the ambulance. And I was taken to this hospital. None of those times did I ask for help. And after I had tried that little suicide attempt in 1977, which is no different than 2020, I got the attention of the authorities and I got carted off to a psychiatric hospital for 72 hours, which was enough time for my husband to obtain a court order from a Fort Worth judge that I was a detriment to myself and others, and I'm court committed to treatment. Never once did I ask for help. I did not ask to go to that detox the first time. I did not ask my girlfriend to come looking for me, and I certainly didn't ask my husband to court commit me to treatment. In fact, I was furious. And all of those things has been God working in my life without my permission. And I will tell you, God still today knows what I need better than I know what I need for me and continues to work in my life. And I'm so grateful. And in that treatment center, I got, I got introduced. I had been introduced to AA but nothing like I had been introduced to that treatment center. And one of the things that happened in that treatment center is they started taking us to AA meetings. They would have people come into the treatment center and get us and take us to AA meetings. They'd put us on a little bus and take us to AA meetings. And they'd have people come into the treatment center and read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous to us. And they began to feed us the program, Alcoholics Anonymous. And in that treatment center, I began to fall in love with the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of the things that I am so grateful for, I am 43 years sober. I have been able to stay sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous for 43 years. And I still have the passion I still have the passion that I got in those treatment centers. And we're talking about step 12. And I haven't been able to do it since March. But I'm one of those people that since I've been sober, I've been going into detoxes. I've been going into halfway houses. I've been going into treatment centers. And I've been taking 
the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous into these treatment centers because somebody did it for me. Somebody did that for me. And I continue to do it even today. Just haven't done it since March. So it's really important for me having had a spiritual awakening to carry this message. While I was in that treatment center, they told us that we needed to get a sponsor. And what I did is I had fallen in love and loved the person that was the director of that detox center. And what had happened is he was a captain in the Navy. He was a Monsignor priest and he was an only child. And I, I don't know what it was about that. I don't know if it was about his restrictive religion and my restrictive religion, even though mine, he was Catholic and I was very fundamentalist. Whatever it was, I fell in love with Frank. And Frank ended up being sponsored by a man I would fall in love with in Long Beach, California. And he had also known the sponsor that I would have in Long Beach, California, because he was with them and had gotten sober at the Long Beach Naval House Hospital. You can't make this stuff up. It's, I have, it's so like our history and Alcoholics Anonymous. God makes a little brick road. And he just puts us on this little brick road and it just starts to unfold and you don't know how it even begins to happen. But what happened was, as Frank told me in that, de in that detox center, when I'm that treatment center that I was in, he said, Polly, I called him and asked him if he'd be my sponsor. And he said, yes. And he says, but don't call me while you're in treatment. Just be at my house when you get out. And what happened is, is I went to his house when I got out and I announced to him that I was on my sixth step. And he announced to me that that was treatment center stuff, but that we were going to go through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and that I was on step one. And what happened was, is that day that I went to his house, we did steps one, two, and three. And he laid out the fourth step for me. And I was going to do a fifth step with him. And what happens today is I do pretty much. I've learned some different things along the way. Of course, we learn more about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. We become more spiritually in tune. But for the basic, for just the basic fundamental way to do the steps, I pretty much do it with the woman, with the women I sponsor exactly the way Frank did it with me. And laying out the fourth step and four columns. And he had called my fourth step in uh, the treatment center. He said, that's, you know, that makes a great novel the way you did it, but it does very little for inventory. And so what happened was, is I still do it pretty much the same way because it's exactly as it's laid out in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And of course, we learn stuff. We stay around AA long enough and we go to workshops and we learn other things. But the basic fundamental way that I do that is exactly the way I did it then. And Frank began to take me through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what happened is, as a result, I started to have a spiritual awakening. And as a result of that spiritual awakening, what I began to do is we tried to carry this message to alcoholics. And what happened was, as soon as I got there, that day, that I showed up at his house the day I got out of treatment after he gave me the directions for we did one, two, and three. And then he gave me the directions for my fourth step to write. He looked at me and he said, you have a car. And he says, you will be going to the detox center 
and you will be picking up the women and taking them to AA meetings. So what happened is I got out of that treatment center after six weeks. It was a 28 day treatment center, but I was invited to stay two more weeks. Some of us are sicker than others. And what happened was at six weeks of sobriety, coming that day out of treatment, I was instructed to do a 12th step. And what happened, I was doing a 12th step with six weeks of sobriety. And had I come into AA that day and had a car, he would have had me doing that as well. So what happens is, as far as sometime doing things for other alcoholics and the 12th step, we do right away. And what happened is, is I started doing the 12th step as soon as I got out of treatment. And I started picking up women at the detox center and two treatment centers. And I started taking them to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. What happened as a result of staying sober and what happened was, is I was in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous just for a few weeks. Two weeks later, after we had done that, I did my fifth step with Frank. And what happened was, is he then gave me the instructions on he, as soon as I finished my fifth step, he told me that I was going to make an amends to my boys and that all of the things that I had to do to make amends, I was going to make amends to my husband what I was going to do with my father that I hadn't been. I mean, I had a, I didn't have a big list of amends, but I had the amends I had were very difficult because my children were very angry and my parents were very scared and my husband, I hadn't been able to take care of. So I had, you know, he told me I was going to do these things. And then after I finished doing those, I said, well, someone asked me to sponsor them. I said, when do I get to sponsor them? And he gave me the answer that I give all the women I sponsor. It's the same answer. And he said, just stay a step ahead. And what I did is I began to sponsor right away. And what I did by doing that, it kept me so involved in Alcoholics Anonymous and so wanting to do my steps and wanting to get through it because here I had this sponsee. And what's so wonderful is during this pandemic, I have got to do a, one, of the, one of these talks with her. And she was the very first person I ever sponsored. I never had enough sense to sponsor her. The only good thing was is that Frank was guiding me all the way with Jessica. And Jessica has just a short little amount of sobriety from me. We have almost the exact sobriety. She was only a child. She was 19 years old. So it was like, oh my God, I just had this kid in tow with me everywhere I went and what happened was as we began without even knowing what we were really doing we began to do step 12 because we started carrying this message and we both started talking and everybody in Texas they have all they have you speak all the time doesn't matter how much sobriety you have. You're always talking somewhere at these little meetings. And we started right away carrying the message. And sometimes I hadn't even gotten to where I needed to be to keep carrying the message. And one of the things that Frank used to say is we've got to get out there and do it. What did Bob and Bill do? They got out there and they carried the message. And what we did is we carried the message. Now, I do a lot of things differently today because I've got a little bit of sobriety behind me. But what I feel so grateful for 
is nobody had me wait. You just get out there and you start doing it. And I've got a couple of women on this on this uh, Zoom that I'm looking at. Melina is one of them. She was pretty young when I got her. And we just said, you know, go for it. You start sponsoring right away. Well, what if, you know, what if this and what if that? Well, we'll work it out. We'll work it out. That's what you do. You just keep doing it. I look at Susie over there. Susie was living with us. Didn't have five minutes of sobriety. And pretty soon she was sponsoring somebody. That's just what you do. You get out there and you get busy in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And sometime, yeah, we're doing step one and maybe step one, two, and three. And then we're hopping over to 12 because it's necessary that we start carrying the message. And maybe you haven't had time to look at all of the inventory stuff. Maybe you haven't had time to do all the amends, but you certainly can carry people to meetings and carry the message of what you know to them. And that's the way I got to do it. And then they say in the third, let me see what kind of time I'm looking at. Uh, And then the third part of the 12 step is to practice these principles in all our affairs. And sometimes that's not all that easy to do. Uh, Sometimes it's like, I have, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this because I think it's great to talk about things that have happened recently. And one of the things that has happened recently is that I have had to work through a resentment and Alcoholics Anonymous, and I haven't had a resentment like this for years, for years and years. And I got hurt so deeply. And what happened was the hard part was seeing what my mistake was in this resentment. And it took me so long in order to get through it. And how I want to explain what happens is, and one of the thing about practicing these principles and all our affairs, because what we were talking about on this Zoom, when we were talking about eight and nine, and Helda was talking about forgiveness, and probably the hardest thing about steps eight and nine are forgiveness. And when we begin to practice forgiveness, we're practicing these principles and all our affairs. And what happened for me, the hardest thing was for me to forgive. And what happened was, is I had, I had inventoried this and I'd inventoried it and I'd inventoried it and I couldn't get any relief. I just kept, I would get relief for a little while and then I'd think about it again. And then there would come all the stuff again. And I'd get all that anger and what they did to me and what happened. And, you know, it just seemed like my part was so small, but it wasn't. What happened was I was not a victim. I had set myself up for that. I had nobody did it to me. I voluntarily entered this relationship. And I voluntarily knew and ignored things that I saw. I ignored them. Because I desperately wanted what I was getting. I wanted this. It was like I had given my heart and soul to this. And I loved it. And I wanted it so desperately. But what had happened is I had seen it along the way, but I didn't want to see it. So I didn't. I didn't, see, I didn't pay attention to, those, to the little red flags I was getting. I didn't pay attention. And what was happening one day, I was just, I am an Emmett Fox girl. If any of you are Emmett Fox readers, and the reason I say his name is because he's such a huge contributor to Alcoholics 
synonymous. And what happens is, and in February, uh, the, in the month of February, he's talking about the Lord's Prayer. And also there, he does a lot of it, and we forgive our the trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And he's talking, he's got about four pages on forgiveness in that area of that, of around the year with them at Fox. And this was in March and I just read it in February and I came back and I said, I need to read those pages again. It just came to me that I needed to read them. I know what happened is, is after I read all of those pages, there's about four pages, I just sat for a minute and just kind of just got quiet. And then all of a sudden, I just felt like God's hand laid on me. And what happened was I remembered what, what I got to feel was how my sons have forgiven me. And I was a child abuser. My first sponsor, Frank, called me a child abuser and told me that I'd have to make amends to my sons. And I thought about all the things I had done to my sons and they have forgiven me. And I had done a thousand things worse to them than this person had done to me. And I was able to forgive. And I knew until I got to that place that I would not be able to be free. And when I talk about working these principles in all my affairs, I have to remember that an amazing principle is forgiveness. I must forgive. I must forgive or I'm forever tethered to that person in a negative way if I can't forgive. And that I had been a person who would have never, ever done that had I not been so sick and had I not had the disease of alcoholism. And because of that, I have been forgiven and I've been able to be to practice these principles in all our affairs. And let me see how many, how many minutes I've got left. Okay, I have about 10 minutes left. And what I wanna do here is I wanna talk about, I'm gonna start, let's, let's start with the promises in uh, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm gonna do from, I'm gonna read from both books. I am a 12 and 12 girl too. I know that a lot of people are 12 and 12 people, but I love both books. In fact, I love a lot of our literature. I use the language of the heart. I use the 12 and 12. I use uh, the big book. And of course, my main guy is the big book. I mean, that's the main guy. But I use all the others just as well. Practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure Immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. I sponsor a lot of women. I am in service in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I don't do this for any other reason. And when I'm working with another alcoholic, I feel fabulous. And when I'm going to a detox center, when I have the privilege of tra traveling to a conference, Whenever I get to be of service, it does something inside of me. It makes, it is an antidote for depression. Today, I'm grateful I'm a person who has depression. Because if I didn't have depression, I thank God every day. Because if I didn't have depression, I wouldn't work so hard in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I do that because the more I do the better I feel. And when I'm working with another alcoholic woman, that's what puts the smile on my face and the kick in my step. I love to hear when that things can be so hard. And when you get to the other side, there's nothing that makes you feel better than to see the miracle and watch God work in their life and to get to be a part of that. 
to get to be a part of that or sit at a detox center and tell a new girl about Alcoholics Anonymous and watch the lights come on. There isn't anything like it. There's nothing like it. It just, it's made, I feel like it's just, it makes me feel so good. It energizes me. When I'm dead tired, it energizes me. <clears throat> it works when other activities fail. This is our 12th suggestion. Carry this message to other alcoholics. You can help when no one else can. You can secure their confidence when others fail. Remember, they are very ill. The promise, life will take on a new meaning. To watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. You know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. Another one is never avoid these responsibilities, but be sure you are doing the right thing. If you assume them, helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery. It is what we can do. You, if you have, I was told at a meeting by my sponsor, if you have five minutes of sobriety, share that five minutes with the person who has none. We can share immediately. And I had a sponsor named Dottie Harris that I had for 33 years after I had Frank. And I have Rena today. And all three of my sponsors are big, big in service. They're the women who are out there doing it. And they're working in this program as hard as if they were a newcomer. And I need to, because I, I really truly believe that I have a progressive illness. And the longer I'm sober, the closer I get to a drink. Because my disease is progressing whether I'm drinking or not. So at 43 years of sobriety, I don't need less meetings. I need more meetings. I don't need to sponsor less people. I need to sponsor more people. And I need to be into more service because I am sicker. My disease is progressing the whole time I've been sober. And I've watched people with long-term sobriety take a drink. And I promise you, they don't last they don't last long. And I need to pay attention to this disease every single day. And I can't rest on my laurels just because I have time. I can't do it. I need this program today. I always say worse than I needed it 43 years because my disease has been progressing for 43 years. You have to act the Good Samaritan every day if need be. Need be. It may mean the loss of many life, nights of sleep, great interferes with your pleasures, interruptions to your business. It may mean sharing your money and your home, counseling frantic wives and relatives, innumerable trips to the police courts, sanitariums, hospitals, jails, and asylums, your telephone may jangle at any time of the day or night. These are the things that I could go on. It's That's on page 97 if you want to read it, where it shows us all the things that we need to do in order to be able to work with another alcoholic. Uh, I also want to read in the 12 and 12, uh -huh. the joy. This is on the first paragraph on step 12 and the tw and uh, on step 12 and the 12 and 12. The joy of living is the theme of AA's 12th step. Oh my God. You know what we're getting to do today is 12 step. We're all zooming together 
there, we get to see each other's faces. If we were there, we'd be at the Mount Baker Roundup. Last night, we would have had Dougie's, um, his, um, oh, what's that beef call that Dougie always makes for us? I mean, we would have had that fabulous, fabulous dinner. And we'd have been sitting there, communa having so much fun with each other. That's what we get to do. And what we get to do is carry the message. Because what we are is sober people sitting around enjoying Alcoholics Anonymous. Here we experience a kind of giving that asks no reward. Here we begin to practice all 12 steps of the program in our daily lives so that we and those about us may find emotional sobriety. Oh, my God. There is no step we have that works on emotional sobriety better than the 12th step. Because emotional sobriety, the more we help others, the more, more emotionally sober we are. When the twelfth step, when the twelfth step is seen in its full implication, it is really talking about the kind of love that has no price tag on. It. Because what we're doing is we're walking out there, no matter what, for fun and for free. You may lose some sleep. You may lose a little money. Whatever you do, you're going to give it, give it all you've got. Give it all you've got. The promises. When a man or woman has a spiritual awakening, the most important meaning of it is that he has now become able to do, feel, and believe that which he could not do before on his unaided strength and resources alone. He has been granted a gift which amounts to a new state of consciousness. And being, he has been set on a path which tells him he is really going somewhere, that life is not a dead end, not something to be endured or mastered. In a very real sense, he has been transformed. And that word, my son came to AA and he said, I knew AA worked because I saw the transformation and my mother. We transform here. We become different people. Because he has laid hold of a source of strength, which in one way or another, he had hereto den here hitherto denied himself. He finds himself in a position of a degree of honesty, tolerance, unselfishness, peace of mind, and a love of which he had thought himself quite incapable. When he has received is a free gift, and yet usually, at least in some small part, he has made himself ready to receive it. And had we not done those steps and had a spiritual awakening, and had we not been at willing to practice, to be able to carry this message to other alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. We could not experience what I consider the greatest gift we as alcoholics are given, and that is the gift to carry the message of this program to another alcoholic. And I am so grateful. When I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I had a husband who I could not take care of. He was 100% disabled from the military. And this selfish, self-centered alcoholic could not take care of my husband. I was incapable of that. And because of a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, my husband Dave got sick five years ago. And because because of that transformation, I can be his 24-7 caregiver. And I don't have to, and it's not a chore, it's not a job, it's a privilege. I never could take care of my own kids, but God has given me five grandchildren. 
And what happened is my second, my second sponsor, Dottie, used to say she had a beautiful relationship with God. And she said, God gives us the opportunity to repeat for correction. He gives us do-overs. And by God's grace in this program, I've been given the opportunity to do some do-overs and be able to have a life today and have been given the gift of being able to carry this message and to be able to put this 12-step not only in helping another alcoholic, but being able to help my grandchildren, take care of my husband, be able to carry this message to anybody who wants it, and to be able to have the blessing, and as the book calls it, the gift, the gift of sobriety and the gift of wanting to share this gift with another alcoholic. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.